Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit, with your host, Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Nonprofit Everything. For Stacy Wedding, I'm Andy Shurick, and we're here to answer all of your questions that you have about nonprofit stuff. Um, We've got a special request this week. So um, we get lots of good questions, but we want more questions. We want to be able to pick and choose of all the interesting things we have. For example, most recently, we're getting lots of sort of high-level questions about board stuff and like advisory boards and, and really complicated tax questions. And while those are really fascinating, I suspect there are lots of sort of more basic questions that we can work on. And also, it would probably be easier for Stacey and I to answer more basic questions. So what we're looking for this week, if you can, um, even if you don't really, if even if you know the answer already and you think it's something that somebody else might not know, um, go ahead and shoot that to us. And um, you can send it to, you can go to the Nonprofit Everything webpage and click the Contact Us link and, and do it there. You can send it to the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits. So it's like info at allianceforNevadaNonprofits.com. Um, you can tweet it at us. You can find us on Facebook. You can call us on the phone. Any way that you get those questions to us, we will um, collect them. And we're, we're looking for the best basic questions so that we can put together a, a podcast episode that tackles those. And for our seasoned listeners who have been in the nonprofit sector for a while, think back to when you first started, what were some of the questions you had? Or talk to your employees and staff. We would love for this to you know, reach people at all levels of an organization, whether, you know, you are the assistant or receptionist to all the way up to ED and everything in between. We'd love to hear from all of you. Hey, everybody, it's Stacey Wedding, and I am here with a really special guest today. So excited to have her. She is a guru in everything to do with sort of the digital world and fundraising. Uh, Her name is Julia Campbell. Uh, She's been working in and with nonprofits for more than 15 years, focusing on uh, particularly development and marketing. Um, In her current position as a speaker and consultant, she helps her clients mobilize online communities and build movements using digital tools and social media strategies strategies. So we are in for a treat. Uh, She's also the author of Storytelling in the Digital Age, a guide for nonprofits. So you should go check that out or buy that if you haven't, if you don't own it. Um, And also Julia is just, she's just in general passionate about making the digital world a more positive and inspiring place to be. And God, don't we all need (laughs) Anyways, welcome, Julia. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Tell us a little bit, you know, maybe something that's not on your bio. I don't know, fun facts, some, some, I don't know. It's some fun thing about yourself that maybe can help the readers or the listeners feel like they're right there with you. Well, I, I mean, I did the Peace Corps in Senegal, West Africa, and I know that resonates with a lot of nonprofit professionals. Usually when I do some kind of speaking engagement or people find that out, I always get emails that say, oh, I was in the Peace Corps. I was in the Peace Corps too. So I did that quite a while ago, but that's really where I sort of honed my chops around storytelling because of course, facts and figures don't really work when you can't speak the language as well. (laughs) That is so true. Yeah. I bet you learned that firsthand. So absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. Cool. Well, all right, let's just dig right in. And, um, here's the question, any tips on Facebook fundraisers? I noticed that they don't charge any processing fees and that seems crazy. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great question. So this is a huge question. So I think I will tackle it in several different parts. The first thing to understand is that Facebook fundraisers and Facebook fundraising tools are completely free to use for registered 501c3 nonprofits. So if you have an EIN number, you are a registered 501c3, you can go to donations.fb.com and fill out their eligibility eligibility survey and also fill out their questionnaire and send them a bunch of documents and basically send them every single 
piece of paper that you've ever had. And they will come back to you with a decision, hopefully in one to two weeks. And more likely than not, if you've jumped through all their hoops, you'll get approved. And then you can start really effectively using the tools that they have on their site. If you don't have a 501c3, you can still send people to the donate page on your website or send people to your homepage. You just won't get the donation features that are within the platform. It's, it's also important to know that if you're an individual for fundraising, there are fees and they completely depend on the country where you are, the state where you are. They depend on how much money you're trying to raise. They kind of vary. So if you're an individual trying to raise money for a cause, there are fees, but still they're a lot lower than like GoFundMe, which I know is about 7%. Um, they're still a lot lower than a lot of the fees that other, um, you know, other platforms charge. So does that mean that if someone's like a, you know, you always see this, oh, I'm fundraising for such and such charity for my birthday, right? So if that's an individual, then those fees would apply to that individual? No. So oh. if, they're ra- if they are raising money for a nonprofit, yes, then the fees would not apply. If they're raising money like for medical expenses or to have an operation okay. or they just are raising money in general for themselves, then fees would apply. But that really rarely happens. I don't see that a lot on Facebook. The birthday fundraisers that you see, the people doing campaigns in honor of someone's memory, those kinds of things where there's a set goal and there's a donate button, those, there are no processing. Okay, cool. Cool. So there are many, I mean, there are pros and cons and I do want your listeners to know, I mean, I don't work for Facebook. I don't have any skin in the game here. My job, I see my job as the kind of conduit of information. So you are able to make an intelligent decision for your organization because Facebook fundraising is not for everybody. I think it's important for fundraisers to understand the technology because people are using it and it's being widely adopted. Like on Giving Tuesday last year, $125 million was raised on Facebook just on Giving Tuesday. (laughs) And they say that since the platform, since the tools have rolled out, over $350 million have been raised. So I bet that number is even higher because that report came out last year. Yeah. So it's certainly something that's being normalized and it's kind of part of our culture and people are doing it. And I get a lot of questions about it. So it's important to know for your organization, kind of the pros and the cons. So, I mean, two two of the biggest pros, it's super easy. It's incredibly easy. I can make a donation to someone's fundraiser in two taps. I tap donate. I tap the amount that I want to donate. And then I tap donate. <laughs> I right, tap right. complete gift. And it completes my gift in two taps. So which really is, user friendly, it sounds uh, like. Within the platform. Yes. And then also Facebook pushes fundraisers. So if you've been on the platform recently, you've seen that it encourages you to add a donate button to your posts. If you visit a friend's birthday fundraiser and you don't complete your donation, you get a reminder that says, hey, Julia, you went to, you know, Susie Joe's fundraiser and you didn't complete it. I'm willing to bet that many of our nonprofit organizations' websites don't do that. If I go to your donate page and don't make a donation, you don't even know. So it has those built-in notifications and reminders. Also, it has the built-in pushes around fundraising. The cons are what a lot of nonprofits really have problems with. So one of the biggest cons or obstacles and challenges is that you don't get a lot of information on your donors because we don't have control over Facebook. We don't have any control. Uh, We're basically renting land there. It's not like if we have Blackbaud or Cosvox or Classy or CrowdRise or any other payment processor, we don't have the control over Facebook. So Facebook puts up a little checkbox when you make a donation and it says, do you want to share your information with the organization? And the donor has the ability to either check it or not check it. So if the donor checks that box, right? Sure, I'm happy to share my information with the organization. Then is it, it's just, I'm assuming contingent on whatever info the donor put when it's out. Okay. 
Yes. So this can be incredibly challenging for fundraisers because we are conditioned to get a donation and then take a donor on a journey with us. We, we get that donation. We work so hard to get that donation and we want to keep the donor in the fold and we want to create a relationship with them and then eventually get a second gift and bring them along the journey. The issue with Facebook fundraising is that a lot of people are making donations not based on their passion for the organization, but based on their relationship to the person asking. So it's more like your traditional peer-to-peer fundraising. Someone's running a marathon and they need to raise 5,000 bucks and everybody gives them 20 and then you don't even know what the charity is. So this bothers organizations a lot. And then of course, the second obstacle is the declining trust in Facebook and the declining trust in social media in general with data privacy breaches in the headlines every single day. And, you know, we all have to grapple with the ethics of using social media for our own personal and professional uses. So tell me if this is a fair analogy, but I'm sitting here feeling like, you know, there's that whole kind of like, okay, have you, have you won the battle or have you won the war? Sort of yes. that, that whole mentality. And it feels like, from what you're saying, in many ways, because it is more peer-to-peer and relational fundraising, not at all to do with the cause, it feels like if you're looking for that quick fix or that quick win of maybe a hit of some extra money, right, Facebook or some of the social media fundraising tools might be a good solution um, versus if you're looking for long-term cultivation, build the donor stewardship, um, this is probably not the ticket for it. Is that a fair assumption? I think so. I, but I, so if you're looking to build your donor file or looking for major gifts, this is not the place to go. But if people are creating these fundraisers for you, those are people that you could potentially cultivate because you will get a notification. So If I start a Facebook fundraiser for Cape Ann Animal Aid, which is where I live, and I did for my daughter's birthday, she's nine, and she wanted to do a fundraiser for Cape Ann Animal Aid. So we started one. We actually raised over $300. We we hardly did anything. I just did a couple of posts. And I think that what's important to realize is that the culture is changing. Nobody wants more stuff. And... Everyone wants to do good, but we don't know where to turn. So a lot of people were saying, oh, I really wanted to make a donation to a local charity, but I had never heard of Cape Ann Animal Aid. And I feel like it was my, you know, I opened other people's eyes to this charity and gave them more exposure, not just raising money. So there are different ways to look at it. If you want to look at it as the direct return on investment of now I have these many donors and this donor is going to be with me next year and this donor will convert into a major gift donor. It's, it's difficult to prove, but if you look at it from the whole viewpoint of the ecosystem of raising awareness and visibility, getting more people involved and excited about philanthropy and giving, I think that can only benefit all charities. I really believe that normalizing this kind of giving, even if it's just small gifts, it's just people dipping their toes in the water. Yeah. And then if they have a great experience with Cape Ann Animal Aid, or they say, oh, wow, I didn't even know this charity existed, then they go volunteer with them or they look them up on the internet. So it's so hard with social media to draw that immediate line between this is going to be a long-term sustainable donor and this is a peer-to-peer donor. It's all very blurred and messy, but it's something to think about. No, I love, you're making a really good point. And, you know, it, what I love about what you said is perhaps, I mean, I love that concept, right, of just sort of encouraging people to give and just whatever, like discover new, right? It's like Mm. a discovery journey to discover new organizations, which they may not have known, which is so awesome. Um, But I also am thinking you make a good point about if someone's actually doing a Facebook fundraiser for your organization, they are committed enough to be doing that. So, mm-hmm. so the major gift potential or the long-term giving potential yes. of that, if that's cultivated the right way, could be huge. Those are the people you want to focus on. So a lot of my clients get hung up on the $5 donor that gave to the $5,000 fundraiser. Yeah. And I encourage them to reframe their thinking and say, no, the $5 donor needs a thank you if they want one. If they don't want one, don't worry about them. But the person that raised $5,000 for you, what is your cultivation plan for them? 
Absolutely. They should get a phone call. They should get some kind of special treatment. And I think we need to start putting our peer-to-peer fundraisers in a special bucket. I don't know if there is some kind of special bucket that we can put them in where we treat them almost like major donors. Because like you said, they're putting their reputation on the line and they are you know, doing the work of raising the money for us and they're exposing us to their networks. So if we give them a great experience and we cultivate them and shepherd them and show them that we really appreciate what they're doing, if we give them the tools maybe to do a fundraiser next year, if we follow up with them, if we say, how did it go? Is there anything we can do? Do you want us to send a bunch of thank you postcards? Maybe they would give us the contact information of their friends and family. So I think there are many creative ways that we just haven't thought of yet. We haven't institutionalized it yet because it's not part of the fundraising status quo. It's not part of our toolbox that we learn. Well, we know nobody, I mean, people do go to fundraising school now, I guess. I know I didn't go to school for (laughs) fundraising. Um, But if you're an accidental fundraiser or marketer and you're kind of learning along the way, it's not intuitive. It's not part of the beginner's fundraiser toolbox where you kind of check the box, annual giving, major gifts, plan giving, but it needs to be. Do you have with any of your clients or are there any sort of examples that any of our listeners could pull up or look at if if they want to understand someone who's doing digital fundraising well, do you have any suggestions about where they can look? Yes. So they're not a client of mine, but I absolutely love them. Best Friends Animal Society. So I'm not sure if you, yeah, they're just the gold standard. Everyone loves them, right? But they really do a great job leveraging Facebook fundraising. So every time they go live on Facebook, they insert the donate button Hmm. and they raise what they can. Anytime they are announcing a campaign or showcasing a story, showcasing an accomplishment, they put the donate button on. Also, uh, Feeding America, No Kid Hungry. Yep. They were one of the first charities to be allowed to use Facebook fundraising tools. And if you go to their website and just click on their fundraisers tab, they have thousands of people raising money for them. And they have a toolkit on their website, a social media toolkit that people can use and go pull images and pull videos and text. So they make it easy and intuitive for their supporters to do this because they're actively encouraging them and they have the resources for them to go out and do it. That's thank you for those examples. I know everyone in the, in the sector, right. Always wants to see what are others doing. And I'm sure many will say, because it's like all too common, right? Everyone says, Oh my God, people love the animals. Anything to do with animals. What if my cause isn't as sexy as animals? What if I have like that? You. So how do you deal? What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Like, are there certain missions or causes that just do better with digital fundraising? Well, certainly if your cause is in the news, you're going to do better. So if you're raising money for a natural disaster or something that has been in the news that everyone's talking about, um, like the paradise fires in California, something like that, you, you do have an advantage and that's, kind of, you know, we can't argue with that. But the argument that we don't have a sexy cause, it's sort of like there are no, you know, you shouldn't be bored. If you're bored, you're boring. Like if you (laughs) think your cause is unsexy, then you need to reframe your thinking. It's sexy to somebody. It's important to someone. You're doing something that is of vital importance in the world. Otherwise, why would you be doing it? The problem is you really need to focus and figure out who your niche is. I think that these small niche causes, like some of these diseases that really only affect 10,000 people a year, but those 10,000 people are super invested and interested and they know the ins and the outs and they have really wide ranging networks. Look at the, look at ALS that actually started in my backyard of Beverly, Massachusetts. No one knew about the disease and that was why they wanted to raise awareness to show people this is the debilitative nature of the disease. Talk about a not sexy disease. It's right. horrible oh. what happens to your body and your mind with ALS. So focus on what, you know, your vision of what the world is going to look like when you accomplish your mission or focus on those little wins every single day. As long as you can show the faces of the beneficiaries. So I'm not saying 
necessarily the person in the domestic violence shelter. Obviously, you're not going to show their face, but maybe you want to show the police chief who crime is down now, or you want to show the community partner or the teacher who's able now to refer students to you. So showing the faces of impact and the stories, that is what works on social media, not statistics, not data. We like to think we're rational beings. We're not, not. but everybody has a story to tell. I get that unsexy cause thing very much all the time. (laughs) And you know, you can't compare yourself to the humane society. You can't compare yourself to some of these other large organizations, but you can do what you can do with your particular audience and your particular cause and your passion. So final question for you, would you, I mean, you made a good point about this, this works, you know, digital fundraising isn't for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And it isn't for every organization. So when would you caution someone against digital fundraising? Well, I think that we all need to have a plan to get there. So I don't think we can just say we're not going to do it because that, I mean, it's, 2019. So (laughs) I think that we live on our phones. We all make purchases on our phones and across demographics, smartphone adoption is up. So I don't think that we should just say we can't do it. I do think there's several things you have to have in place first. You should definitely have infrastructure and be able to adequately create a plan and evaluate the different platforms. So if you're putting out fires every single day and you are just trying to make payroll, then do those traditional fundraising tasks, call board members, have those coffees, write those grants, do what you need to do to get that money coming in. And then in terms of digital um, technology that you need, your website needs to be mobile optimized, and you need to have a very easy way for me to make a donation on your website first. I would absolutely recommend focusing on your website first because you own it. You're not renting your website. You're not renting your email list. You own those assets. Whereas if you put all your eggs in the social media basket, you are renting those assets and they can, you know, pull the rug out from under you at any moment. So I would say focus on your website, focus on your email first. And then once you feel a little bit more confident, then kind of dip your toes into the social media fundraising waters. That's great advice. I know so many organizations, right? Get excited. It's, I I call it um, bright, shiny object syndrome, right? Where you're just like, oh yes, they're doing Instagram. Yay. (laughs) But then I always say, okay, so you have Instagram and then you're filling out your Instagram bio and you're sending me to your website, but it's not mobile optimized and it looks terrible and I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing on your website. So it's always, you know, back up five steps, figure out your goal, figure out what success looks like, figure out where your audience is, and then choose the tools that will help you accomplish that. Never start with tools first. That's great. I think we should all print that out, like make that a bumper sticker or something. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Well, this has been amazing. I've learned so much from you. I hope, and I'm sure our listeners have too. Thank you for your time, Julia. And we really appreciate it. Yeah, this was awesome. Hey, this is your virtual high five and fist bump for getting through another episode of Nonprofit Everything with my wonderful co-host and leader of all of this, Andy Schurecht. And of course, I'm Stacey Wedding, and we appreciate you joining us. And we also really appreciate Anne, the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits that makes this possible for you. So give a a, a shout out to Anne. And oh, God, when I say shout out, everyone tells me I'm Eddie Murphy. So I need to just stop (laughs) doing that. Ah, That's one of those like ticks, right? That's like a verbal tick that I really struggle with. So, okay, you all just guilty confession. Okay, no more shout outs. And now I'm going to say it 10 times more. But anyways, uh, thanks again for listening to us. Of course, we would love your engagement. And uh, until next time. (laughs) 